Gwen is the product manager at Confluent, and she has spent 15 years of experience working with code and customers to build scalable data architectures, integrating relational and big data technologies. She's been thinking about real-time data processing at Facebook. <laughs> Take it away. Yes. So I had a week to prepare this, so I picked an easy paper. For me, easy means no mass. So basically, that's the kind of paper I'm talking about. And it's a paper that love-hate relationship. There's parts of it that I absolutely adore and parts that I don't, and I'll let you know about all of them. And I think they got the name wrong. I mean, they, what they call real-time data, the real-time data processing can mean a lot of things. The specific things that they talked about in the paper is what we call streaming data pipelines. And they actually, I'll show you, they actually give uh, pretty specific examples. It's a subset of real-time data processing. So this is the full name of the paper, and the first interesting thing to note is how late it was published. So it was published 2016. At 2016, Twitter already went through two stream processing systems. Kafka already existed, Flink existed, Spark streaming, it's like, this is third generation, basically, because so much stuff already existed. And as such, you kind of evaluate it, and they evaluate their own system compared to a lot of stuff that was already out there. And the first thing you do when you start reading a paper is figuring out what kind of paper is it? What is it going to be about? And they made it easy. Right there, second paragraph of the abstract, this is about making decisions. So we are about to build a real-time stream processing thingy, what type of decisions we need to make, and given those decisions, how did, what were the options and how did we went around doing them? So they compared the alternatives. And then they also proceed in the same paragraph, basically, to make an apology. Our main decision was targeting seconds of lat latency, because they know, publishing in 2016, that everyone else in the space is either looking at milliseconds, or like tens of milliseconds, maybe hundreds of milliseconds, and if you don't, you have to apologize for that, which is what Spark Streaming did for a very long time. So they're like, okay, look, we were looking at that. So the paper is half decision making and half justifying their decision to go with seconds of latency. And they keep doing it throughout the paper. Why did we go with seconds? The really nice thing about the paper is, unlike a lot of papers that you read, they don't say that, oh, we just built Heron, our new stream processing thing, and it's the best thing ever because, and it's way better than everything else because. They actually say they don't do, they, sh they basically say, we built this architecture, we made these decisions, it's one of many decisions we could have made, there is a lot of trade-offs, which means that the one thing you shouldn't do, and I'll be very mad if anyone goes out of the room and goes and do it, is to basically copy all their decisions and say, we built stream processing just like in Facebook, <laughs> because your system is not like in Facebook, and they carefully detail all the decisions so you can make the right decisions on your own. Okay, that's me of the soap books. So they start out by basically showing what kind of applications are going to talk about, the kind of stuff that they write, and they have something that kind of aggregates trends, so who is talking about the Super Bowl kind of thing, how many people really care about Brexit. Uh, they have something that does real-time feedback for mobile apps, so they'll know that, hey, if people can't really use the mobile app for some reason and it keeps disconnecting, they'll know about it. They have all kinds of stuff. All of it is things that they call real-time applications and I call uh, ETL, or streaming data pipeline. So the line is very blurry, but you can see that even though it's very Facebook problems, they look a lot like um, other problems that you may have to write, especially the last one. Everyone wants to uh, basically take load of their very expensive databases. And they kind of show a schematic of all their systems. Basically, every single system gets some data from either mobile applications or web applications. It puts it into this message bus that they're going to talk a lot about. They process it using one of three systems. That the, the core paper is about the yellow part, the Puma, Stilo, Swift, Scribe message bus, and then they write outputs to a bunch of systems, which is why I call it ETL, right? It looks like ETL. You read data from there, you do stuff, you write it. Just because it's in Facebook doesn't mean you cannot call it what it is. Um, so the system we're going to talk about, Puma, is um, basically SQL stream processing. They do uh, materialized views, so like 
please uh, aggregate, pre-aggregate the stuff here into all kinds of uh, databases. They write it out to their uh, serving databases. Uh, they also do things like, hey, give me the trending topics every five minutes kind of thing. Uh, Stylus is a more, it's a stream processing system written in um, C, which is uh, kind of cool, and that's, it looks a lot like other stream processing. If you know about Flink or Spark Streaming, or one of those, it's very similar. So they have SQL, they have ultra-optimized something in C, and then Swift, even though it sounds like fast, it's something that they wrote in Python, it's very low throughput, and the paper barely just mentions that it exists and try to cover up the embarrassment and not talk about it too much. And then they have outputs. The output they talk the most about is laser. It's a distributed key value store. Basically, if you know RocksDB, it's distributed RocksDB. Really, really cool. They talk, it has cool optimizations for this use case. They talk about it a lot. They also write data to Scuba, their metric monitoring. Charity upfront is going to talk about it next, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. And they have Hive, which is basically a huge data warehouse, which is pretty terrible. They don't really talk a lot about it either. So in the, one of the things they do throughout the paper is keep sneaking in cool bits of information and then pretend they didn't exist. So uh, actually, I think I pointed wrong, and it's actually Stylus and not Swift. But anyway, Stylus um, is a stream processing system, and they wrote that like a lot of stream processing systems, it has to uh, handle imperfect ordering. What do you mean by imperfect ordering? I have data on my mobile device that we are going to process, and I just went out of service. And I come back up, and suddenly it dumps data for that is three or five hours old because I just went on a plane. And they still have to process it correctly. So they have to do something about all those late events, and they say that they do it, they get the original time from the device so they can do it. But, and one of the things that Stylus gives them is the ability to estimate how much, what is the probability that we processed all the events for the last five minutes? And there's not late events somewhere in the system, so a low watermark. With 99 probability, we got all the information up to this point in time. This kind of thing, it's super valuable, and it's really, really hard to estimate. There's a lot of statistical methods. We spent a lot of time in my company trying to do it. It's really hard, we didn't solve it in a way that we're really satisfied with. And they say, oh, by the way, we solved it and they don't mention it anywhere again, and they don't have any paper on how they solved it. How can you do it to me? If someone's for Facebook and knows how we solved it, please tell us. It's important. <laughs> okay, so continuing on, here's a nice system, even though they don't tell us everything about it. And then they show an example. So they talk about decisions, and they um, explain the decisions in a context, which is important. That's how design patterns work, right? It's decisions made in a context. So the context is this pipeline, which is f trending five topics in the five minute window. What do people talk about? And you can see that the nice thing, even though the problem is very Facebookish, everyone has a pipeline like that. That does some filtering, and then joins with some external data sources, and then does some ordering, and tries to figure out what is more important, and then write it somewhere. Like this is very, very typical ETL-ish thing, right? You filter, you join, you aggregate, you store somewhere. That's kind of normal. So that's really good. And then after we explain the context, we get into the tofu and potatoes of this entire dis discussion. What were the design decisions that we had to make? And they started by summarizing everything in very handy tables. And they say that, hey, there is like, things that we care about in the system, which is ease of use, performance, fault tolerance, scalability, correctness, and so here's our decisions, and kind of different decisions impact different parts of the system, and that also helps you see which decisions are more important. And then they also take the decisions and say, here's how we solved it, and here's how other people made their own decisions. And I kind of argumented the part in red, I, they left out the systems that they care a lot about. So the first decision they had to make is decide on language. And they had three choices. We can have a SQL, we can have a functional programming language, and we can have something procedural that kind of gives you more control and performance, but it's harder to write than SQL or functional. We already know what they chose. I gave it away in two slides ago. They decided to mix, mix, mix and match, uh, but they don't do functional. So they have SQL for people who want fast and easy, but not a lot of control. And they, want, uh, they have the C++ one for people who need a lot of control and a lot of performance. 
fair enough, that was pretty easy. Deciding not to decide is always the easiest. <laughs> Decision two is data transfer. As you've seen, there's all those nodes doing different things. There's the filterer, and then there's the joiner, and then, and then, and then. How do these send data to each other? How are they going to talk to each other? And they, there is, say, three options. You can do RPC. Basically, you have one program talking to another, sending it events directly. And apparently, Millwheel, Flink, and Spark Streaming all do that, and it gives you very nice speed, all going in memory. But that kind of means that you have to handle failures and persistency in some other way. Uh, Heron has a message forwarding broker that basically you, you talk to him in order to move messages around, and it allows you to do things like back pressure and to multiplex, so you can actually send an event to two processing processors at the same time. That's kind of better, but then you have this single point of me uh, message forwarding broker and other things that you have to manage. Maybe you don't want that. Uh, they went, and we went, with a persistent stream storage, which is basically you have a message bus, but instead of making it transient, you actually store for prolonged period of time every single message that goes through. It's very reliable, and it also decouples producers from consumers, right? So if one of the processors, for example, the ranker just went down, and no one else in the chain has to know about it. Messages will basically accumulate for however long you want in this in-between buffer, which is really nice. So they basically said that, hey, okay, we chose uh, this persistent uh, message bus. We didn't go with Kafka like 99.9% .9 of the universe. We wrote our own, we have Scribe. In their defense, they wrote Scribe at more or less the same time that Kafka was written, so they weren't really reinventing a wheel that they knew about. And then they said another one of those crazy tidbits. Using Scribe imposes minimum latency of one second per stream, which means that you write something and then it will take you one second to the other side to get it. First of all, who even talks about minimum latency? How does that work? You were talking like 99.9% .9 latency, that kind of thing. Minimum latency means that there is something in there that does sleep for a second, because even if you read from disk on occasion, it takes shorter than a second. So like, I'm not sure where is the minimum latency of stream comes from, how did they make it happen, and yeah. So that's another thing that's kind of a complete mystery to me. Like, and also, if a minimum is one second, what is their 99.9% .9 latency? <laughs> because in Kafka, the minimum is five seconds, five milliseconds, and the 99% latency is like a second or maybe slightly over. So like, yeah, that's really, really weird. Anyway, they really, really love Scribe. They spend an entire page talking about how awesome it is. It gives them fault tolerance and fa ability to move fast and maybe sometimes not break things, high performance. And the, the whole thing is that because those processing units are independent and because you store every bit in input and output, everything is awesome because you can debug and you can fail stuff and everything is amazing. So they really, really like it. Decision three. It's processing semantics. And this they actually do very well. First of all, they say, what is it that stream processors do? They read inputs, they write outputs, and they also write checkpoints. On occasion, they have to say, this much we already processed. And then they say that some services are state stateful, which means that they also need to preserve state and checkpoint their state. Like, what is the current average in, in, uh, uh, for the last five minutes, not just the output in the outputs. So, and so they separate it so that you're going to have semantics for the state, how stateful services are going to, to maintain their state, and semantics for the output. And each one of them can be at least once, meaning we are processing everything, but they could be duplicates, at most once, meaning we could lose some events, and exactly once, meaning exactly once. <laughs> That's easy. And, either one, and the state can be exactly once while the output is at most once. Like you, can, you can get a lot of flexibility. And nobody else that I know ever wrote about the distinction between how you maintain a state and how you do the output. Everyone thinks it's the same, but it's really not. So that's pretty cool. Facebook vertic, as usual, it depends. So they gave some examples. The ranker writes to an idempotent system, meaning that if you write duplicates, it's not going to matter. So going to be at least once. Scuba can lose data, 
but it doesn't handle duplicates very well. So that's going to be at most once. And it turns out that exactly once is really, really hard because they didn't have a single example for a system that did exactly once. Yes, <laughs> people there are kind of nodding, yeah, we tried doing that, that's really freaking hard. We also tried doing that, yep, it's freaking hard. So yeah, we, we all agree, it's freaking hard and, they did, and apparently if Facebook did it, they don't tell anyone. And then again, another interesting node on side effects. If you want to do exactly once, it means that you have to write the state and the output and the, and the offset and the checkpoint and everything to a transactional system. So things will happen in one transaction. This takes a long time. And why just wait during this time if you can do some stuff that is stateless and uh, has no side effects? For example, this serialization is stateless and takes tons of CPU and a lot of effort. So let's just keep on doing that while stuff is, think, is getting written to a transactional system. That's a pretty cool optimization. Decision four, we said we have to save state. How do we save the state? Well, option one, just save it in memory and have user replication to make sure it doesn't get lost. VoLDB used to uh, do it. It actually requires a lot of hardware, a lot of network. The, even VoLDB kind of stepped back from that after a while. Option two, you have a local database. So you basically persist stuff to the local disk and then also save it, back it up somewhere in case the local disk get lost. A remote database, just, just write it to a, a Cassandra or HBase or in their case, a laser. Uh, you can even say that I don't have a database. Upstream has a database. I know that I can always get the event from scratch if I lo lose them, so, but nobody really does that because it takes forever if you lose enough data. And then you can also do globally consistent snapshot, which is kind of odd and Flink explained very well and I want to do it justice. Facebook decided on two options. I say Rhode Island and Alaska because it's like small state versus large state. <laughs> um, I'm not American, I hope I got it right, but uh, I think I did. So if you have a small state, you can maintain it on a local database, and then you, they back it up to HDFS, they use RocksDB as the local database. If you have very large state, you cannot really store it locally, you won't have enough memory, you won't have enough space, so you're going to send it to a remote database, and you're only going to cache a very small subset of the, your state locally, and you have to continuously refresh the state of a database. Obviously, this slows things down. So they have this really, really cool optimization. And for me, that was the best part of the paper. That's like, that was worth reading everything. If an aggregation is a monoid, meaning that it's a transitive, cumulative, that kind of stuff, and you can, they basically say that you don't need to get the state from the database in order to make the, the aggregation. You, if you don't have the state in the database, you can aggregate the empty state and then merge it with the state in the database. This is what monoids let you do. And this merge can be asynchronous, which means that it will never slow you down. So instead of saying, oh, I need to make a change, but I don't have the state, let's go to the database, wait a few milliseconds, get it. Now we make the change, now we write it back. They say, oh, I, get, I don't have the data, no problem. I'll just continue and figure it out later. If this wasn't cool enough optimization, which in my opinion is cool enough optimization, they, they, because they wrote their own fucking database, they made the merge operation much more efficient in the database. So they actually have a database that natively supports this kind of merge. And it works to be the same database that I'm using for stream processing, so I immediately went to see, hey, can I do the same? No, because they have it in the C version of RocksDB and not in the Java version of RocksDB. Guess which one I'm using. So I'm kind of out of luck, but if you use RocksDB and you can do this optimization, please do it because you can see what impact it has on performance. This is just super awesome. Last decision, reprocessing the data. You can, if you need to recalculate something, maybe you want to do this kind of A-B testing to see or you have a new type of algorithm you want to compare it to the old one. You can basically just go back in the persistent stream and try to reprocess from scratch. It requires long retention. You can try to do both batch and streaming, or you can develop a system that the same code can run in batch mode or streaming mode. They basically went with a batch and streaming, but they said that, well, first of all, we have Puma. It's just SQL. SQL runs on everything, so we can run SQL in streams, SQL in batch, that's easy. For Stylus, our C code, 
Basically, they do some kind of, they have their own C compiler. Duh, it's Facebook, why wouldn't they? And they basically, their compiler generates two binaries, one for streams and one for batches. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Again, small tidbits in the paper that are like, why don't you write a paper without that part? <laughs> that's the good part. Okay, and then they go to applications, which is just a real tour, uh, tour of very useful design patterns. So one example is that Puma, the SQL part, was optimized for applications with millions of different time series, which means that they can really shard it and distribute it everywhere. But for Scuba, apparently the, most of the queries is just drawing lines on a chart, and who wants more than seven lines on a chart? You can't even read it. So they had to had, learn how to handle that. So they do like extra sharding and uh, pre-aggregation and the real aggregation. So it's, and that's something that I also always do because sometimes you use it to also handle uh, keys with a long skew that uh, screw up your sharding. So that's a u super useful pattern. So highly recommended to read it if you do stream processing just for the design patterns. And then they go for a lesson learned. So obviously they like the independent processors. They like being able to move fast. They like having a high level of abstraction in Puma that they can, they can use to iterate before they need to write something that's really fast. They like the ability uh, to uh, deploy stuff. They, uh, they have a lot about monitoring, especially how lag between when was the message produced until when was it actually processed, the most important thing. And they instrument a lot of stuff out of the box. I'm sure uh, Charity will tell you a lot about that in a second as well. The moment I'll step onto the stage and later. And they also have good future features, which I'm kind of glad that they didn't solve yet, so I don't have to be guilty for not solving myself. For example, being seeing that, hey, this process is lagging and there's a backlog accumulating, let's scale it a bit more. Let's add more and more instances automatically. It makes tons of sense, it should be easy. I, but yeah, we didn't do it and I feel bad, but I don't feel that bad because, hey, they didn't do it either. So, thank you.